Welcome back to Cinematic. I'm Ryan. We're talking about kung fu movies, and it's it's getting a little bit ridiculous. Uh, I'm gonna jump right into it. We're talking about Disciples of the 36th Chamber this week. So third in the franchise, we've talked about 36th, although it might have been in a combo episode of sorts, we've talked about Return to the 36th Chamber in its own episode. And with Disciples, he kind of does what he did with the second, where if you remember, it wasn't a direct sequel, which I do like, number one, because it's novel, but also because it doesn't do the sequel thing where, especially if they're using the same main character, they kind of have to find another journey for him or some other character flaw he has to work on for that movie. So instead of doing that, they focus on a different character altogether, even if there are some similarities between all of them, I will say. So the one thing that is more similar than was in Return is that Gordon Leo turns out, not Liu, is reprising his role as Sante in this, but he's not the main character. So you, you kind of get the best of both worlds for me anyways, because like I say, I like this approach because it's novel, but also because I do get to see Gordon Leo doing Sante again, but as more of the wizened abbot kind of, you know, where he ended up in the last movie, like what if that was his journey and now he's doing great? This is, this is him doing great. So it's kind of still fun to see in that way. And in that way, this movie is, I guess, more of a direct sequel to the first movie than the second one was necessarily. But the main character here is instead Fong Sai-yuk, which I didn't know until the end of the movie. So throughout the movie, and by extension throughout my notes, he's referred to as Fong shi yu So if that's who I say, that's who I'm talking about. But why that matters, if you're wondering who's Fong Sai-yuk, he is another Chinese folk hero. And according to Wikipedia, is a semi-fictional character, which I'm not sure how you are one of those, but I guess that's kind of the trick with folklore is it does become kind of a dialogue between truth and history to some extent, which can be largely interpretive as well. But close as I could tell, he's been a character in Chinese wuxia since the 1600s. So my guess is there's a little bit of the two going on. Number one, maybe... Who knows? But also, quite possibly, there are some elements of truth, right, that have just been lost over time. Nobody can say, because again, this is all largely a verbal tradition as well, when the kept records were not destroyed in some regrettable circumstances otherwise. But for now, let's just say that Feng Sai-yuk usually pops up in conjunction with the five elders or generals of Southern Shaolin Monastery, and honestly will come back to him. There are some movies where he is front and center that I am also very much looking forward to. So for now, Feng Sai-yuk is Feng shi yu and here he's played by Xiao Ho, which I've also mentioned before, but can't remember for what movie, because I believe he's been in every single Lao Kar Lung movie that I've talked about so far, at least. So he's definitely a part of that family unit. But here he plays the son of a Cantonese family, and there are three brothers, and the other two basically try to keep him out of trouble, kind of at his mom's behest, which, by the way, another fantastically strong female lead, played by Lily Lee, if you remember, we talked about her a little bit in A Diagram Pole Fighter. I say we, I mean uh, Mitch was kind enough to to point her out, and she did a fantastic job, and, and obviously I was very impressed with as well. But here she again plays this mother that really the only reason uh, Feng shi Yu has any of his raw talent molded into any form, it seems like, is because of her, because she has kind of kept watch and, and trained him also straight up. And while the movie does tell us a lot of that, it does also show us even more of it by way of a fun too short fight between Lily Lee and Lau Kar Lung himself, who is in this movie again, and actually plays kind of a Manchu middle manager of sorts. He's not the commander that I'm going to talk about, but he is this, it serves as a go-between because what happens is Xiu is out there causing trouble and makes so much trouble with all the Manchus that Lau Kar Lung shows up at his house and they kind of strike a deal. You know, Lau Kar Lung wants to 
kill him or get rid of him or something. And his mother makes a deal where it's like, what if we just send him away to the temple, which also historically accurate. That was where a lot of people sought refuge from the Manchus. So uh, Lao Kar Lung's Manchu agrees to this. And that's where Feng Shiyu basically comes into contact with the 36th chamber. So I don't want to gloss over Lily Lee's character at all, but even if she's not front and center, we just we have another Lao Kar Lung movie here that's not without a strong feminine force, let's say. And that's basically the setup for the film. In Shi Yu, Lao Kar Lung has created another kind of brash young man that can be shaped through Shaolin. But with some key differences, I think this time around, it's a lot more about the team, maybe, and uh, being a team player, even. Leadership, quite possibly, because uh, Shi Yu is, is a quick student in terms of that. He, he garners a group of brothers around him within the temple that do kind of hang on his every word. Uh, logistically, another difference, the movie is more about breaking out, necessarily, than, than breaking in. Whereas, if you remember the first two movies, there was uh, certainly an obstacle to overcome for those two students in gaining access to the Shaolin Temple and the 36th Chamber itself. Here, Shi Yu breaks out because he is kind of there by way of a deal, not necessarily by his choice, you could say. And in breaking out, catches the eye of the Manchu commander that I mentioned, who, in seeing his skills, kind of starts to suspect some things about the 36th chamber. So, Shi Yu is this brilliantly naive, again, rawly talented young man that really falls for the kindness of this Manchu commander that exploits it to, you know, learn about the 36th chamber, what might be going on there, but also right up until the end, which, which we'll get to. But I guess that, that's what I wanted to point out is maybe the main difference between this movie and the other two. It was almost like for a franchise that's especially about, you know, bringing Kung Fu to the people in a way, the, the first movie was more of, you know, Kung Fu is for you. The, the second movie might have been, yes, you too, even you, all of you. And then this movie has more of a tempering tone, I'd say, that's, that's kind of like, yes, whereas the, the inexperience or even brashness of these students has been exploited for good, you know, by the abbots of the of the Shaolin Temple to you know teach kung fu and instruct, even without them knowing. Sometimes, uh, here it's like that can also be used for ill, you know, because essentially that's what the Manchu commander does. While, you know, Gordon Leo's Sante is, is, I think, always clued in. It, it's far. Okay, I don't know if it's far less than the other movies, but. I get the feeling like Sante was in the dark about some things in this, whereas in the other movies, I guess with the exception of the 36th, where Sante is becoming Sante, um, in certainly the second movie, it was like Sante just knew everything, and that kind of allowed him to navigate the training of this young man. Here, it's it's like Shiyu does get kind of one up on him here and there, and I'll explain more in, in the third act here. But in the way that that kind of recalls the, the themes of the first movie, where Sante himself was kind of that brash young man, it adds a lot. I think it stands on its own two feet as well, but in the moment between Sante and Shi Yu, when they have those exchanges, it does carry a fair amount of weight. In fact, one of my favorite lines from the entire movie is a line that Sante speaks to Shi Yu, I believe right before he's ejected from the temple, because what happens in the story is that he basically doubles down on the Manchu commander as being um, actually kind to him and not trying to exploit him in some way. And Sante says to him, no one thing in mind, nowhere for the dust, which no idea if that's translated correctly, obviously don't want to know either. I think it speaks volumes and is fine as is. And I might as well say this is where it gets a little ridiculous because Yes, Lao Kar Lung still is not missing a beat when it comes to action. There's all sorts of clever choreography. There's still moments of surprise. Again, after I don't know how many movies, because I didn't actually look that up, he directed at least 25 total by way of Hong Kong Movie Database. 
and we are, okay, if the first one was in 1973 and this one's in 1985, obviously we're three quarters of the way through and he's still coming up with choreography that is novel and surprising and entertaining. That's the least of it because besides all that, strangely enough, what I want to talk about is actually Lau Kar Lung as a writer because we talked about it a little bit in, um, again, this will be our eight diagram pole fighter episode where I'm referring to we and meaning Mitch. Uh, he hinted at the fact that Lau Kar Lung didn't write a lot of his films and sure enough, he wrote five of the 25 that he directed, again, going by Hong Kong Movie Database here. Uh, My Young Auntie in 1981, uh, Legendary Weapons of China in 1982, The Lady is the Boss in 1983, Eight Diagram Pole Fighter in 1984, although I believe he did have a shared credit on the writing for that one, but he is solely credited, again, as far as the internet goes, with writing Disciples of the 36th Chamber. And I haven't seen My Young Auntie yet, uh, or Legendary Weapons of China, or Lady is the Boss for that matter. Talked about how much I loved Eight Diagram Pole Fighter. Obviously, it's way up on my list. It's on number one on Mitch's list. That's why we talked about it. But I haven't seen a ton about Disciples kind of in either direction, really. Certainly not above the first and second movies in the series. So this is kind of one of those instances where I get to give you a straight shot. I have no idea if this is a popularly held opinion or not. Not that that would matter all that much, but Here's what ends up happening with Disciples of the 36th Chamber in the third act. So the Manchu commander has devised this red wedding of sorts, which I think I get the reference, even though I haven't seen the series, and has planned for a Han girl to marry a Manchu man. So there's this idea that it might be a symbol of peace between the peoples. So you could say that the racial tensions are at their height. Uh, and in the same moment, he has given the plan to Shi Yu, who you, you kind of get the feeling it's it's pushing his naivete to its brink. You know, there's there's a few moments where you think maybe he's starting to think that the Manchu commander's um, intentions are not pure, but still goes to his brothers and invites them to the wedding, which is kind of the purpose of the wedding, is to draw out to the brothers so that the Manchu commander could kill them. We know that much. Uh, Sante finds the invitation, so he kind of knows something's going on, so he's out on the prowl. So literally all of this kind of edge of your seat stuff that all comes to a head in like the final 15 minutes, and I'm not going to spoil it, honestly, other than to say that it's kind of like the raid, which is high praise coming from me in that they, they get locked into this wedding compound. So they're kind of trying to escape and Sante headbutts somebody onto a roof. So if that doesn't get you to watch it, I, I don't know what else will, but why I say it's becoming a little bit ridiculous because here we are in yet another Lau Kar Lung movie that has not made anybody's lists above the original 36th chamber or the sequel that I've seen yet and is also just the third in a franchise. How often do you say this about a third movie in a franchise? It's fantastic. I don't know. Am I that far gone? Maybe if I lost all objectivity at this point, perhaps, but it's great. It is, it is a really fun, fantastic movie that this might now be like one of the franchises at the top of my list. Just, you know, in, in any, I'm not, <laughs> I watch other movies than Kung Fu movies. You know, I would still put this franchise now up, up with the best of them. So take that for what you will and take this for what you will. Cause I am going on vacation kind of this next week. I say kind of, cause I'm, I'm probably still going to work, but I don't know if I will work at this necessarily. So there's a chance some of the next movies I talk about will be the Hong Kong version of Jackie Chan's The Protector. And I'm careful to stress the Hong Kong version because part of what this series is now going to do uh, <laughs> is 
make its way into what the states did with a lot of what we've been seeing. So the protector is important in that way because it was supposed to be one of Jackie Chan's kind of breakout movies for the state. So there is a U.S. version that is bad and made a lot of compromises, according to Chan himself. So I was able to track down the Hong Kong version and don't know. Again, this might be one of those ones that goes by the wayside. There's also, I think, Brawl at Battle Creek or something like that that came a little bit before and was also expected to be something of a breakout for him overseas that did not quite land. And this series is going to head in that direction somewhat because, you know, go look at the list. I'll put the link down in the description again and you can see what quite possibly might be to come. Not that I'm jettisoning Hong Kong action by any stretch of the imagination. There's still uh, plenty to look forward to in that regard. But again, moving chronologically, I find it quite interesting to see some of these back to back to be like, this is what happened in Hong Kong. And then this is what the states thought for some reason. And uh, we'll get into this more with some of the sillier movies, you could say, which I still have a special place in my heart for because there are people at the center of some of those with all the good intentions in the world and talent. So it'll be a fun discussion regardless of what you might think about some of those movies anyway. So either way, thanks for hanging out. Good, uh... Bye.